Get up. Call for get up. Maybe, yeah, uh, welcome everyone. I guess you can hear me. Uh, yeah. So yeah. let's wait one minute more uh, mm -hmm. and then we will uh, we will start. Uh, uh, this slide already reminds you that please uh, keep your uh, uh, mute your microphones and switch off your camera because uh, uh, connection will work better for sure in that way and we avoid any disturbance to our uh, speaker. Um, okay, let's go. Yeah, let's go. I think exactly. Let's give it a start. Hello and welcome, everyone. Let me introduce myself first. So my name is Andrea. I'm a, an academic at Imperial College London and in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And I'm part of the Imperial Life Cycle Network and this uh, seminar. And today the seminar will be given by Jasmine, and thanks a lot, Jasmine, for being with us today. Uh, the seminar will be about emissions, accounting and mitigation in higher education institutes. And uh, very briefly, please uh, uh, keep, uh, actually, maybe let me go to the next slide first. Uh, please keep your uh, microphones mute and uh, switch off your cameras. So as I mentioned, this uh, seminar is part of uh, the Imperial Life Cycle Network. And uh, let me say a little bit, uh, a few words about the network. So the Imperial Life Cycle Network has uh, as a main aim, uh, the uh, bringing together and connect life cycle related research and researchers as well, mainly across Imperial, but uh, eventually through this seminar, we wish to involve more and more uh, people. So uh, we want to connect members of Imperial, but to the wider community uh, working in life cycle as well. And the purpose of the network eventually is to foster collaboration, facilitate networking. We want you to share knowledge with us and contribute eventually to the advancement of life cycle field. Uh, I would say across all disciplines, because as you may know uh, way better than me, life cycle is not just related to science, not to a specific engineering field, but it goes uh, way across, uh, uh, all, all across all the fields, including our private life and the way we approach life, the way we approach uh, sustainability eventually to try to make an impact uh, in what is our future. <clears throat> so if you want more information about the network, I invite you to visit uh, our pages. We have a, a LinkedIn group, uh, Twitter, or just simply connect with us uh, through our website or send an email and we will try to reply to you uh, as soon as we can. Generally, we are quite uh, fast in that. Say that, uh, let me remark that uh, this is just uh, one of the uh, many seminars that the network has been uh, organizing already. So you may find the recording of the previous seminars. This seminar will be recorded as well. And then uh, let me announce that uh, there will be a new seminar coming on the 27th of June. And in that case, Dr. Lewis McDonald. <coughs> Sorry for that one. So, <coughs> Dr. Lewis McDonald from University of Bath will be presenting a seminar in the work on biogenic carbon in life cycle assessment standards and practice. And then uh, in September and November, we want to run another two seminars. In that case, we will uh, we will have Prof. Bernard Steubing and uh, Dr. Roman Saki uh, from Leiden University. And uh, well, anyway, they will uh, follow up and give uh, their perspective on life cycle assessment. And then we will have uh, Niels uh, Jamblat uh, that will talk about LCI data. This will come uh, very, very soon. Um, let me introduce then uh, our speaker today. 
So welcome uh, and thanks for being with us, uh, uh, Jasmine. So Dr. Jasmine Cooper is uh, from Imperial College. The title of the seminar will be, uh, and it is, uh, Emissions from Higher Education Institutes. And uh, Jasmine will try to address the question, how are they measured and what is being done to cut emissions? Uh, beef of uh, uh, biography, biography of Jasmine. So Jasmine uh, is a research associate in the chemical engineering department at Imperial College London. Uh, she joined uh, Imperial in 2018 from the University of Manchester, where she attained her undergraduate and PhD. Uh, both of them were in chemical engineering. In 2022, Jasmine joined the Department of Sustainability Committee, calculating uh, the scope three or indirect emissions from the, the department activities. And since then, Jasmine has been active in supporting the department and the university in uh, how it can reduce uh, uh, its greenhouse gas uh, emission. And more in general, she tried to better engage with staff students, uh, try to bring uh, sustainability and all the sustainability elements at the forefront uh, of her uh, uh, research activity, but not just a research activity, just try to set examples on how we can uh, develop a more sustainable future. So thanks a lot, Jasmine, again, for being with us. I think uh, uh, at this point, uh, uh, I should just say uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and uh, please uh, start uh, anytime you want. Yeah. Maybe I, should, I will great. stop sharing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, so as Andrea said, uh, I'm going to be talking about how higher education institutes calculate their carbon emissions. So I'll be going through the different methodologies and approaches used as well as covering some of the approaches different universities are using to try to cut down on their carbon emissions. I'm going to be focusing more on a UK perspective, but I will be talking about how other universities, um, both uh, like in Europe and outside Europe, calculate uh, their emissions. So um, first things first, what is the relationship between higher education and net zero? So obviously higher education is going to play a crucial role in terms of how we decarbonize and reach net zero, not just through the education that universities deliver, as well as the research that universities carry out in terms of decarbonization, but also universities are prominent public profiles. So when universities and specifically the people at universities act progressively, they can inspire others to act as well. So I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have been aware of the student protests that we've seen in the name of climate change, and even some of you may have participated in some of these protests. So we're seeing more and more students um, wanting more action taken in the name of climate change and to decarbonize. But it's not just students who are choosing to strike. We're also seeing staff at universities also choosing to strike in the name of climate change. So if we go back to the initial question of what is the carbon emissions of the higher education sector, is it big? Where's it coming from? Then in general, um, the higher education sector as a whole, as a fraction of a country's national carbon emissions, is pretty small. So, for example, in the UK, the UK's higher, higher emission sector, a uh, higher education sector is responsible for around or is equivalent to around 4% of the UK's total territorial emissions, so pretty small. But it's not insignificant if net zero targets are to be met. It's important that all sectors who contribute and generate greenhouse gas emissions take actions to cut their emissions. So looking into how much carbon is emitted by a university, um, typically universities will emit in the order of kilotons of CO2, typically hundreds of kilotons of CO2. Mm -hmm. And the factors which impact how much carbon is being emitted by a university uh, are where the university is located. So the country where the university is located will have a big impact on the university's carbon footprint, mostly related to the energy supply and energy landscape in, of that country. But the factor that impacts universities' carbon emissions the most is actually the type of university that they are. So universities that are a lot more orientated towards STEM, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, they will have much higher emissions than universities that are much more arts and humanities orientated. And this is purely because of the types of facilities on STEM universities versus non-STEM universities. So labs 
are quite big consumers of not just energy, but also materials and resources. And this really ramps up their emissions of STEM universities versus non-STEM universities. So looking into how universities calculate their greenhouse gas emissions, overall, there's a variety of different approaches that are used, both in the peer reviewed literature as well as the non peer reviewed literature, which is prominently the um, emissions reporting by different universities. Most universities do now report what their greenhouse gas emissions are. Um, the key thing is that when it comes to calculating their, their emissions, there is currently no standardised framework that is mandatory to be used, but there is work being carried out. Um, in the UK, the Environmental Association for Universities and Colleges, or UAC, they have created a standardised carbon emissions framework, which they rolled out last year. Currently, it's voluntary. Um, but it is hoped that universities will use it or adapt their current emissions reporting frameworks to the UAC framework. Um, <laughs> but, but going, looking more into detail of what the different methodologies used to calculate emissions are, uh, the most common methodology used is the GHD protocol. And this method is used both in the peer reviewed literature, but also it's the method that is used exclusively in the university emissions reporting. Outside of the GHG protocol, there are other methods, but this is entirely in the peer reviewed literature. So methods like life cycle assessment or other methods that require emission factors are typically used to calculate the emissions from universities. So going more into detail on the GHG protocol. So for anyone who's not familiar with the GHG protocol, it's an international standard that is used for corporate emissions accounting and reporting, and it treats emissions based on ownership. So splits them into the direct emissions and the indirect. So the direct emissions are the emissions that are a result of any energy or fuel use, or from any like direct venting or leakage leakage of greenhouse gas emissions on a from a corporation. So for universities, the main source of scope one emissions are from power generation and from vehicles. So if a university has any on-site power generation, so there are any generators or combined heat and power units, then these would be your scope one emissions. Also, if a university has any vehicles that it owns and operates, these would be also be your scope three emissions if they are like petrol or diesel cars. Another source of scope three emissions are refrigerants. So for any air conditioning systems or chillers or freezers that use CFCs as refrigerants or cooling agents, any emissions of these into the atmosphere would count towards your scope one emissions. Another source of scope one emissions would be what's called other. So this would be emissions from land use, agriculture or waste management that is on campus. So if you have any methane or nitrous oxides being emitted from any agricultural um, waste management uh, processes, then these would also count towards your direct emissions. Um, scope two is energy related emi re uh, emissions, but energy that is bought in. So for most universities, this is grid electricity would fall under scope two, but also if you buy in any heat from external sources, then this would also count towards your scope two emissions. But typically for universities, scope one isn't is usually just grid electricity. So in general, the way universities uh, calculate emissions from scopes one and two sources is fairly standardized and robust. Most universities will have uh, energy metering data or data on fuel consumption, uh, which they can then use to multi to calculate what the emissions are from the energy and fuel use. But other source um, scope one emissions is a bit more difficult to get data on. Uh, refrigerants are particularly difficult to get data on. So these are typically excluded from a uh, university's emissions reporting as well as from other corporate reporting. And other other types of scope one emissions are also typically not included just because it's quite difficult to accurately measure what the emissions are if you don't have any direct measurement technologies or systems in place. So another reason why the scope one and two emissions are generally well accounted for and methodology is fairly robust is because when you're using a GHG protocol, 
Um, they're actually mandatory and required. So if you're using GHG protocol, you have to estimate and report these emissions. Scope 3, on the, on the other hand, is optional. And Scope 3 covers anything and everything else that isn't covered in Scopes 1 and 2. So it covers a lot of different things. It's the embodied emissions of anything that is consumed or businesses that are provided to a university. And it's optional to include it and it's also optional what is included under it and as a result whether or not you include it and what you include can have a really big impact on what your total emission estimates are. So if we look at what is currently reported for UK universities, so in the UK um, emissions data for different universities can be found in the UK's Higher Education Statistics Agency also known as HESA and they report data for scopes one, two and three. Um, but for scope three, they only report data for waste, water and wastewater management only. And as a result, if I can just get my laser pointer, um, based on what HESA reports, the emissions are dominated by scope three, by, by scopes one and two emissions, so the energy related ones. But when you take into account other sources of emissions under scope three, the total amount of emissions estimated as well as the distribution of emissions can drastically change. So in another study that was carried out by the Royal Anniversary Trust, um, they factored in a lot of other different categories in scope three besides just waste, water and wastewater treatment. And they actually calculated that scope three is the most important source of emissions and accounts for nearly 90% of universities' total emissions. Within the scope three, it really varies what contributes what. The, in this particular study, they found that supply chains, which is basically all the stuff a university would buy and consume on campus, as well as travel for both uh, staff and students, are pretty big sources of emissions. Whereas uh, waste, water and wastewater would be pretty small because you they're not even shown on this graph. So what you factor in in your emissions accounting can have a really big impact on what your emissions are. And it's not just estimated. This isn't the case just for the UK. It's for elsewhere as well. Uh, depending on what is included, it can really impact what your overall emissions estimates are, as well as what the distribution of your emissions are. So typically, uh, the energy related emissions are well accounted for in emissions reporting for universities. So energy use for electricity and heat, as well as fuel used in vehicles. These are pretty much well accounted for. There's not any study that I've come across where they don't factor these in in the emissions reporting. However, for anything else, it really does vary depending on whether or not a university can collect data on other areas such as procurement or waste and and also whether or not they have the resources to be able to convert that data into emissions. So that's an overview of the general approaches universities use to calculate emissions. So I'm going to take you through a deep dive of how emissions are calculated for a university as well as on a more granular level for a university department. So Imperial uh, College London do calculate and report their greenhouse gas emissions uh, every year in their annual sustainability report and they use the GHG protocol methodology and in their most uh, recent uh, emissions reporting they did use the new UAC uh, framework which is which does follow the GHG protocol. So based on Imperial's calculations, um, the university is responsible for an emission of over 200 kilotons of CO2 equivalent per year, with emissions really being dominated by scope three em emissions. So going into where emissions are coming from for Imperial, in terms of scopes one and two, um, in Imperial, um, the energy uh, used on the different campuses uh, has an impact on what the overall emissions are for the uh, university. So Imperial has a, multiple campuses with the South Kensington campus being the main campus or the biggest campus, uh, but the South Kensington campus has the bulk of its heat and electricity generated through a natural gas powered CHP unit. Uh, so that is 
the blue section of the bar. Uh, any remaining heat or electricity is met through either grid electricity or from natural gas boilers. For other buildings in other campuses, that are part of Imperial uh, heat and energy, heat and electricity are met through grid electricity alone or from a mixture of grid electricity and, um, and natural gas boilers. And so obviously the UK grid mix has a big proportion of renewable or low carbon electricity. Uh, so this is why grid scope two is a much smaller proportion than scopes uh, one, which are pretty much just from natural gas consumption. So for scope three emissions, Imperial do take a quite uh, comprehensive approach. So they factor in a, mul um, a lot of different uh, activities under scope three. So they cover everything from purchases and supply chains. So that would be pure procurement emissions, as well as emissions associated with travel. So commuting, but also travel for work. So business travel, as well as international student travel to Imperial as well as wastewater and wastewater management. And based on what Imperial has calculated, the biggest sources of emissions for the university are actually procurement and travel, particularly business travel and student travel. Procurement is the biggest source of procurement emissions and accounts for nearly 50% of our total scope three emissions, so it's pretty big. And uh, business travel, so these two combined account for around 43%. So, these three basically combined account for over 90% of our scope three emissions. So they're a huge chunk of the university's emissions. So going into how these emissions are calculated for, for these three categories, well, this one and this one. Um, so emissions from business travel are actually calculated through our travel booking server. So for anyone who works at university or is a PhD student at university, or works for a company where you travel for business, you've probably used Agencia. They're a travel um, booking service. And in addition to allowing people to book their travel needs, they'll also calculate the carbon emissions associated with any travel booked through the service. For air travel in particular, Agencia use a methodology that's compliant with IATA, who are the International Air Transport Association. Uh, so when you calculate emissions from air travel, there's a variety of different methods that you can fly. Typically, you would multiply an emission factor by the distance traveled. And the emission factors used can vary quite significantly depending on what kind of emission factor it's you're using or what calculator you're using. And this is why if you're comparing, if you're looking to offset your emissions from air travel, you'll get different results of what your carbon emissions are, depending on which calculator you're using, because they all use different methodologies. Um, the IATA methodology is a bit more comprehensive versus some other methodologies in that, in addition to the flight uh, distance, they'll also factor in whether or not your flight is direct or indirect. Also, the cabin class is better accounted for in the IATA methodology. And also things such as bulk load is factored in in the emission factors used by IATA. So bulk load is on airplanes. Uh, in addition to carrying your luggage, they also carry like parcels or goods that need to be transported to other countries. Uh, so that the amount of bulk cargo versus actual passenger luggage is factored in and that they that is used to then calculate the emission factors for people traveling in airplanes. For procurement, um, in the UK, we use a tool called HESCIP, which stands for the Higher Education Supply Chains Emissions Tool. So HESCIP is a tool that uses DEFRA derived emission factors and then uses these to estimate emissions for all the different services and goods that a university buys and uses. So HESCIP does this by basically taking spend data, so how much money is spent on different spend categories like lab supplies, ICT services, AV and audio services, um, business services, catering, etc. And it basically multiplies the cost by an emission factor to generate carbon emissions. So obviously not the best methodology to be using, but currently it is the best methodology available for institutes in the UK. 
so obviously not the best method to be used as obviously using a cost based approach. Your estimates of your emission estimates are very sensitive to things such as inflation. So when prices go up because of market conditions, even though you're buying the same number of items or fewer, potentially your as the cost has gone up, that's going to be reflect as an increase in your carbon emissions. And similarly, um, your overall carbon emissions would be sensitive to like discounts and deals. So if something is on offer, for example, 50% off or buy one, get one free, even though you're buying the same or you're potentially buying more because the items are on sale at discount, that's actually reflected as a reduction in your greenhouse gas emissions. So obviously not perfect, but it's currently the best method that we have for procurement. Just because procurement encompasses a really large number of different categories, uh, some of which there are alternative sources of data for, such as lab supplies like lab chemicals and potentially some equipment. But for other I items that would fall under procurement, they're very difficult to get data for, uh, be either because there is currently very limited data available on what the emissions could be, for example, software licenses and some ICT applications. But also some categories are very would be very difficult to apply carbon accounting frameworks to or life cycle assessment frameworks to, such as library subscriptions, legal services, banking services, and even advertising. So, so in general, procurement estimations do have a high uncertainty, uh, but this method is the best that we have available so far. So that's how universities calculate their emissions overall. Uh, if we look at things on a more granular level, so in a university department, in general, university departments can use the same um, methodology that is used by universities as a whole, and it's encouraged that they do so just so that results can be more uh, comparable. So in the chemical engineering department, we calculated the department's carbon footprints for the year 2018-19 to 2019-20. And based on our results, we actually calculated that the biggest source of emissions for the department is actually electricity. Uh, so scope one, uh, followed by lab supplies, scope three, and then business travel, also scope three. So the distribution of emissions for the department is actually quite different to what the university estimated for itself as a whole. And this isn't unusual or to be unexpected. Um, the university's emission total emission estimates take into account things that don't directly impact the department's activities. So things like student accommodation, construction, um, the sports facilities, the canteens that are on campus. These are all included in the university's total carbon footprint. And these contribute to why the distribution of emissions for the university looks quite different to what is estimated for one of the departments in the university. So going into more detail on where the emissions are coming from. So for the C, for the electricity, um, electricity is mostly from the CHP unit. Uh, not, su not surprising, the chem energy department is based in the South Kensington campus, which gets most of its heat and energy from the CHP unit. Uh, with the remainder coming from grid electricity and natural gas boilers. I will say that when comparing the level of difficulty and ease of access of data for a department versus the university as a whole, you would think it would be easier, but it's actually harder. And this is because we get our energy from different sources. So it's quite difficult to track how much of electricity consumed in the buildings that belong to chemical engineering are actually from the CHP versus from grid electricity. So in our assessment, we just assumed what the average or the total average was for the campus also applied to the chemical engineering department. Uh, for heat, it was a bit easier to get data for. There is metering data available for how much natural gas was consumed by the CHP unit, as well as what is consumed for, for the boilers. And there's also um, what there was also better metering data for heat in the in the building. So if we look into what the energy demand is in the department, um, overall we that we found the energy demand in the in the department to be quite high, and um, 
because our period of study also coincided with COVID, we were able to compare the impacts of lockdown. So pre COVID versus the lockdown, uh, specifically the first lockdown of 2020. And when we did the comparison of the department's energy demand before and after, we did see that during COVID, when there are much fewer people on campus, there was a significant drop in energy demand. However, our energy demand is still pretty high. It's uh, 500 kilowatts. And we were quite shocked by this. And we are currently still investigating where our energy demand is coming from and what we can do to try to bring this down. So we're implementing a metering and submetering campaign to try to figure out what is causing our high energy demand and what we can do to bring it down because our energy demand is really high to give you a context of just how high it is. Uh, department's day, typical daily electricity demand or use is equivalent to 1,700 UK households. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's high and uh, we're trying to bring it down. So finally, moving on to the scope three emissions. So we use methodologies same as what the university uses. So Agencia for business travel and Hesket for procurement. And using these methods, uh, we estimated procurement again to be the biggest source of emissions in scope three, followed by business travel. Obviously during COVID, pretty much dwindled because no one was going anywhere. But interestingly, uh, during COVID, our emissions from scope three increased, but this is actually because we just spent more in this year versus the previous year. Um, we're not certain if this is because of inflation, because during COVID prices of things did go up because there were supply chain issues, but it's very difficult to compare, directly compare emissions from procurement year on year because we, the department buys different things every single year. So uh, so some things that are very expensive one year, they may not be purchased in another year. So it's quite difficult to make direct comparisons. We are looking into alternative ways to calculate emissions from procurement, um, but we are yet to like verify anything in terms of alternative approaches. So that was an overview of how to calculate emissions from in higher education institutes. So overall, you need a lot of data and it's also very time consuming. Um, just because there's lots of different methodologies and approaches that you need to apply. But there are some tools that have been developed to try to simplify this. So for labs in particular, uh, I should point out this is only for labs in France, but there is a calculator called 1.5, which will calculate your scopes one, two and three emissions for laboratories, both research at universities as well as private laboratories uh, in, in France. There's also tools that have been developed for universities as a whole. So UAC have a calculator that can be used to calculate emissions for universities as well as USTEP. So overall, higher education institutes, uh, they're doing putting lots of efforts to try to calculate their emissions. And overall, the universities individually are responsible for emissions of hundreds of kilotons of CO2 equivalents per year. So obviously there is room to bring this down and a lot of universities are quite um, on board on the idea of decarbonizing. And in 2021, uh, over 1000 universities from 68 different countries in the world actually made pledges to reduce their emissions uh, specifically to be net zero or carbon neutral by 2050. So Imperial, I'm not totally sure if they were one of the over 1000 universities in 2021, but we do have a sustainability strategy that outlines what the university is going to do to reduce its emissions, as well as reduce its impacts to other areas of the environment. Uh, it's not just Imperial, other universities in the UK are also um, releasing sustainability strategies that outline what they're going to do to decarbonize and reduce impacts to other areas of the environment. And also globally, universities are uh, taking actions and outlining what they're going to do to try to reduce their emissions. So overall, when it comes to carbon, um, most universities, when they have set net zero emission goals, uh, this typically focuses on scopes one and two emissions. Um, this is because this is the area where universities do have the most control. They have a lot, they can actually influence where they get their energy from, and therefore it's the uh, most easiest area to tackle in terms of reaching net zero. Uh, in terms of when universities want to be net zero by 
by. It's between 2030 to 2050, depending on the university. Uh, ETH Zurich is 2030, I believe Imperial is 2040, um, University of Mantra is 2050. Um, outside of scopes one and two, when scope three is mentioned in universities' emission reduction targets, it's typically something on, along the lines of try to reduce it by as much as possible, primarily because there's a lot, there's a high degree of uncertainty around what the total actual emissions are for scope three, but also um, universities are very reliant on their suppliers and providers to decarbonize, so less control over how things are decarbonized. In terms of decarbonizing emissions from energy usage, uh, i.e. scopes one and two emissions, um, there's a big emphasis on energy efficiency. So installing more energy efficient lighting, better insulation, uh, more efficient uh, equipment would go a long way in terms of reducing the total energy demand in university buildings and therefore reduce the energy demand of universities as a whole. But there's also a big push towards electrification and having renewable electricity. So at Imperial there are plans to uh, replace the CHP unit with heat pumps um, but, and, but also the universities are looking to use either install or use renewable energy or lower carbon forms of energy. So the University of Melbourne, they have been using power purchase, purchasing agreements to secure um, low carbon energy from a big wind farm. And it's estimated that through the power purchasing agreements, the University of Melbourne have been able to cut their uh, emissions by nearly 97,000, not 97,000, 97, yeah, 97,000, 97,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And similarly, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, they've actually been using food waste to convert into clean renewable energy. And it's that they've estimated that by using food waste and turning that into biogas and burning that for electricity, they've cut their emissions from electricity by 0.6 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. However, not all universities can currently use renewables to decarbonize. For some others, it may be the need to use you go to a lower carbon form of energy first in the interim and then eventually go to renewables. So, for example, in West, in the West Indies, um, fossil fuels are still a prominent source of electricity in general from grid electricity. So a universe in Jamaica has actually made a decision that instead of using grid electricity, which in Jamaica is mostly natural gas and a big chunk is oil, they're actually going to generate electricity using natural gas and then eventually transition to something that is renewable. Uh, so obviously for universities, uh, labs are an important source of emissions just because of the equipment that they use as well as the different materials that they consume. So if you can make labs more efficient and sustainable, this would go a long way in terms of helping universities reduce their overall em environmental impacts. So universities can do this by encouraging labs and lab PIs to sign up for lab sustainability, sustainability uh, schemes. And currently um, Imperial recommend two, which are LEAF, which is the Laboratory Efficiency Assessment Framework. So this is a framework that was um, created by UCL and they are a framework that guides users through different actions they can take to save on plastics, water, energy and other resources used in labs. The other uh, framework or initiative that is being encouraged by Imperial is My Green Lab. And My Green Lab is a certification program that's designed to give labs actionable ways to improve their environmental performance. The main difference between LEAF and My Green Lab is that LEAF is more of an independent assessment. So you, you get given the framework, you complete the assessments, uh, whereas in My Green Lab, you're engaging directly with My Green Lab. So it's more of a continual improvement process where they identify where what you can make improvements on and then just continue from there. OK, so another area where universities are looking into or making pledges to decarbonize is around business travel. So for most universities, it's quite a significant source of emissions. And for decarbonizing, there's a variety of different approaches that are being put forward. 
So one way of reducing your emissions from air travel is simply to fly less. So do you need to fly to that foreign country to attend that meeting or workshop or could you do it virtually? And also, could you take a train instead of flying to that city that is like 20 or 100 kilometers away? Uh, so these would go, these would really help towards reducing emissions from air travel, but also downgrading is actually quite impactful in terms of reducing emissions. So trying to make economy the default travel cabin class as much as possible would, does actually uh, result in quite surprising large reductions to emissions. So for short haul flights, economy has 1.5 times lower emissions than business class. And for long haul flights, economy is 1.6 times lower than premium economy three times lower than business and four times lower than first class. So downgrading is actually quite impactful in terms of reducing your overall carbon emissions. Um, in addition to um, downgrading flying less and substituting flying with rail, um, there are other initiatives that are being put forward by different universities in a bid to decarbonize their air travel emissions. So some universities are implementing offsetting in a bid to reduce their air travel emissions, uh, whereas for some others, it's considered a last resort to use offsetting. But another thing that universities are starting to implement now is to actually uh, either have some kind of tax on carbon for any air travel or, kind, or a mitigation fund. So UCLA in California, they have implemented a, a, an air travel mitigation fund. And so for this particular fund, for any tra uh, business travel that is carried out by staff and students at university, in addition to the ticket fare paid, you have to pay an additional levy on top of that. And that levy goes towards a mitigation fund, which then supports different sustainability initiatives on the UCLA campus. So this has funded things such as installing more efficient lighting in buildings, as well as upgrading um, equipment to more efficient versions, uh, i.e. Um, chillers and freezers. Um, the fund was also used to support a climate literacy uh, program at, at UCLA. So while it doesn't directly reduce emissions from air travel, it, it does result in reductions to emissions in other areas of where UCLA's emissions uh, would have been generated. And finally, on um, procurement. So procurement was identified as being a really big or potentially a really big source of emissions. Um, but currently, it is quite a difficult one to tackle in terms of how to reduce emissions. For universities that have released policies or made pledges outlining how they're going to reduce emissions from procurement, a large part of um, trying to reduce emissions from procurement actually involves um, engaging with your suppliers. So Imperial, we have plans to engage with our suppliers uh, to try to collect more accurate carbon footprinting data from our suppliers just so that we can improve our methodology. Um, but other universities are also looking to supplier engagements. Uh, so, so Aga Khan University in Pakistan, they have a supplier engagement program which stipulates how much of their spending for procurement is to go to companies that have um, emission reduction targets, specifically emission reduction targets that are science-based, so SBTI compliant. Other areas where universities have outlined how they're going to reduce emissions from procurement include um, reducing consumption, so buying less stuff, but also buying items that have circularity incorporated so that the items don't go to landfill at the end of their life, they can be reused more often, uh, thereby reducing the need to buy more stuff. So not quite an ultimate slide, but nearly at the end. Uh, so overall, uh, there's lots of different actions being taken by universities to cut their emissions, uh, mostly focusing on scopes one and two emissions, which may seem disproportionate considering where emissions are estimated to come from from many different universities. But it's the scope one and two, which is where the universities would would have the most impact. Uh, in terms of the types of goals and ambitions that, are, that have been set out, some of them are quite ambitious, spe specifically the net zero, 
decarbonizing energy uh, targets. These things are would require quite large financial investments and would also potentially take quite a while to roll out. So whether or not universities can be net zero in scope one and two emissions by their specified timeframes or or endpoints is yet to be to be determined. But overall, universities are increasingly becoming aware of their environmental impacts and trying to implement measures to reduce their impacts. So last slide. Uh, so overall, there's a variety of different methods that are used by universities to calculate their emissions, with the GHG protocol being the generally the most used method. In general, uh, scopes one and two emissions are generally well accounted for, mostly because they're compulsory if you're using a GHG protocol or a method that is based on it. Uh, scope three, on the other hand, really varies depending on whether or not it's actually included in the first place, as well as what's included under it. And as a result, whether or not it's included and what is included can have a really big impact on what your total emissions are, as well as what the distribution is. Um, there's a large number of different initiatives that are being rolled out by universities in a bid to decarbonize as they are becoming increasingly aware of what their total emissions are, which are typically kilotons, so up to hundreds of kilotons of CO2 equivalent per year. And some of these initiatives that they're rolling out are quite ambitious, uh, so it is yet to be seen if a university can successfully be net zero by 2030 to 2050. And with that, I will stop. I think we have 12 minutes for questions. Uh, Anastas, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, thanks, Yasmin. That that, that was uh, quite a good, good uh, and very eye-opening uh, presentation on the university side mm -hmm. side of things. Um, we have uh, we have some questions, but mm -hmm. uh, please uh, feel free to. Um, to, to, to add questions on the chat um, if, if you have any. Um, the first question, I think maybe you did sort of um, uh, touch on it, but perhaps you could expound a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, uh, concerning how uh, procurement emissions were accounted for, uh, for, for Imperial. Um, I, I wonder whether you, you'll be able to, to say a little bit more on, on the procurement side of things. Yeah, so procurement emissions are calculated using the Haskett tool, which uses emission factors to convert cost or spend into emissions. So it uses a variety of emission factors from DEFRA uh, to convert the emission factors. And the emission factors cover a really lot, wide range of different, um, different products and items. Um, but in general, um, there's like two versions of the of the emission factors that are available, and the Haskett tool uses the domestic version versus the industrial version. So one of the things that we're looking into in terms of improving the Haskett tool is whether or not, if we use the industrial version of the emission factors, what impact that would have on the university's procurement emissions versus the the versus the domestic. We're also looking into other ways to try to improve emissions from procurement. So if we can get data from suppliers and what the carbon emissions are for some of their products, uh, that could really help towards better understanding what our total emissions are. So under procurement, like there are different categories in procurement in the Haskett tool, but you don't have to use it to calculate emissions for all procurement because technically business travel would fall under procurement, but we obviously don't use Haskett. We have better data from Agencia. So if we can like start to remove things from Hesket, um, that could go a long way in terms of improving certainty of what our procurement emissions are. Uh, thanks, and uh, just to follow up uh, on that, um, it, it's about transparency of the Hesket tool. How, mm -hmm. how transparent is it? And is it possible to also manipulate and uh, perhaps, uh, use on or other sources of uh, emission factors rather than emission factors that are already within the tool. How transparent is it? So the tool, the methodology in terms of how the emission factors are generated in the first place is not that particularly transparent. Um, there is work that was carried out to try to understand better where the emission factors, how they're derived. 
And generally, it's not that well understood how the emission factors go from what DEFRA have published to what they are in the calculator. So in that area is not as transparent as it could be. But in terms of manipulation, it's uh, I think it would be fairly easy to manipulate if you did have better sources of data. There was work done at Imperial uh, previously um, by a PhD student who was looking into how to improve the Heskett tool by looking at different factors such as changing the classification of what is what the different cost categories are, as well as um, looking into other sources of like cost emission cost based emission factors and what impact that would have on Heskett. So in general, you can man manipulate it if you did have better data. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, the other question also, I think maybe you touched on 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 this, um, is regarding uh, the the flight element. Uh, so is the the class element, so economy versus um, uh, fast class, considered within the calculation within uh, the travel calculations? Yeah. Could so you expand on that a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. Sure. So carbon class is factored in in the agencies uh, calculations. So they will factor in the the carbon class, whether it's economy, premium, first or business, and that does have an important impact on what the total emissions are. Um, I will say that for flights, in addition to cabin class, uh, there are other factors that will impact what your total emissions are. Uh, recently, IATA, which is who developed the methodology that Agencia used, they have re they have changed or made changes to the methodology used. So previously, they were using a distance based methodology, so applying an emission factor that factors in things like cabin class and bulk load, um, and multiply that by the distance. But recently, they're looking into switching to another method that uses that's based on flight duration as flight duration is a more accurate representation of how much fuel is being consumed by an airplane. And um, that's because if you just multiply by the flight distance, it doesn't factor in things like if your flight is being delayed on arrival because the airport's really busy, so you're just constantly circling around an airport for 20 minutes. And also it doesn't factor into account things like if you're very lucky and your plane gets caught in a tailwind, uh, your flight might arrive an hour early. That happened to me once. It was mind mind boggling. We arrived, our flight time got cut by cut in half because we managed to catch a catch a tailwind. So um, by fa using a, a methodology that's based on flight duration rather than um, travel distance, that can lead to more accurate emissions of what emissions are from from uh, from air travel. But yeah, carbon class is also a really important factor. Thanks, Yasmin. Um, the the other question is is also on travel. Does everybody use the travel service for booking? Uh, so the total for business travel for universities uh, looking lower than uh, uh, this person has seen uh, some in some other places. Uh, so does everyone use the, uh, the the travel booking systems? I think referring to Agencia here? Yeah, so not everyone uses Agencia here. And um, I didn't mention in the slides, but the estimates of business travel um, that were presented for both the university and the chemistry department, they factor in non-Agencia booked air travel. There was a student who a few years ago spent a lot of time sifting through um, a lot of PO documents to try to see how what how many flights are booked separately outside of agencia versus agencia and we came to they and they came to the conclusion that about 60 percent of flights are booked through agencia with 40 percent booked not through agencia so that is applied to the estimates for the for the university as well as the chemistry department but overall no it's not a count um not everyone books through agencia and that does make it quite hard to try to estimate what the overall emissions would be because uh, we're just assuming that the people who don't book through Agencia they're traveling like similar to the people who do book in Agencia so that's why we just apply the flat out 60 percent 60 40 40 ratio. 
Uh, thanks, Yasmin. And I'm assuming that accounts for students here yeah, because the majority of students might not necessarily be able to, yes. to do so. So the business travel is only for staff and PhD students and maybe MSc students who travel for like work related activities. So for conferences or workshops, um, student travel. So international students who fly to another country to study. Uh, that is estimated um, using a different, not not through agency, that's me measured using data on where students are coming from and then just multiplying distance from either the centre of that country to kind of take an average distance of the different airports in a country um, or from like the different main airports of, of, of a country to the country where students are studying. It is quite controversial in terms of whether or not a student's flight emissions should count towards a university's total carbon emissions or whether or not a student's emissions from flying to another country to study would be part of their own personal carbon footprint. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's quite a grey area there yeah, in terms of ensuring the system's boundaries are yeah. properly uh, allocated. Um, yeah. and, and the other question here is about, I think it touches a little bit of a policy and the strategies that um, universities do tend to have, or Imperial, of course, has mm -hmm. uh, published a uh, strategy. Are, are there definitions of what net zero in terms of climate neutrality actually means for uh, universities? And are there any publications uh, for this? And I think maybe that mm -hmm. uh, alludes to the strategies that uh, universities mm -hmm. tend to have. Uh, yeah. But what's your take on that? So different universities will either specify net zero or carbon neutral and typically when they use one or the other they do explain what they mean by it. So it is defined but in terms of whether or not there's something that's been comprehensive trying to compare what different universities use in terms of the definition I haven't seen that available yet but let me see if I can dig up Imperial's um, sustainability report. Yeah, that that's that's now public public yeah, publicly public. available. Yeah. So yeah. Um, no. Why 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 do you do that? Um, maybe the other question is uh, if there is anyone here mm -hmm. uh, who would like to sort of do this for their own universities. Um, what what are some of the challenges that they have to um, uh, to be aware of? So the main challenges to be aware of are data availability. So if you want to be able to collect data, you need to know who to contact to get the data. So for anything energy related, so the metering data or the heat metering data, you need to know who in the estates team to contact for that because that is really their area that the estates team at universities are responsible for the management and operations of buildings on campus so you would need to know who to contact for that data also data on waste that's also typically centrally controls that you would need to know who to contact in the states for data on that but for data on like air travel and um, procurement you would need to know who in the department or in, or in the university to contact for that as well. So those are the areas where there would be data available um, because it is um, being collected and logged. But for other areas, you would need to actually do surveys to collect data. So data that would be for things like commuting as well as potentially like international student travel if you were interested in calculating that. Uh, thanks, Yasmin. I think uh, that's uh, that's the time we have. Okay, um, cool. And we've gone through all the questions that uh, mm -hmm. were on the chat. Um, okay, I've got, got my own questions, but maybe we can, uh, <laughs> yeah, can ask have me a later. chat that over coffee. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, thank awesome. you so much for the, the, the work that you have done and taken time to present this to us today. Thank yeah, you awesome. very much. It's been my pleasure. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.